church i welcome everyone to our tuesday leadership development in jesus name you have heard already but i'll tell you again you know what i'm going to say this thursday power night will bring power into your life and every coach and spiritual pneumonia god will wipe away from your life in jesus name new strength new power new anointing a new authority will come into all the lives of our ministers and members in jesus name i'm eager for the weekend friday and saturday morning soaring above tell me now your own limitation limitations will be cancelled from our lives in jesus name it will make you strong make you mighty make you powerful the ministry will become easy in your life and as you speak lives will be changed and transformed in jesus name as our moderating minister said that god took the spirit on moses and placed it on the 70 elders and praying it will happen to you the same power the same authority the same anointing will flow into your life in jesus name you believe it it will happen father in the name of jesus we thank you tonight we bless your name because you always bless us you delight in our meeting together and you delight in our meeting you face to face so that you can pass your very mind your very heart your will your word your ways into every one of us lord we're praying tonight you will transform every life whatever we need give unto us in jesus name and we pray that that promise and provision and what you have planned to do in everyone that comes to you to also go to minister to other people we will be partakers in jesus name thank you because we know it is done in jesus name we pray god bless you you can sit down tonight as you already know from our search the scripture topic we're speaking on something essential that christ himself has promised and he has provided and he has a purpose for it tonight we're looking at the word of god concerning the promise and the purpose of the believer's sanctification the promise and the purpose of the believer's sanctification if anybody ought to be sanctified it should be the minister if anybody ought to be made holy more righteous having the very nature of god if anybody ought to reflect the very life of christ and the very nature of god and the very ministry of christ it is the minister that comes to him and also is available for the members look at the word of god in leviticus chapter 20. leviticus chapter 20 i'm reading from verse 7 it says sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy for i am the lord your god you can tell he was talking to people who were already connected with him i am the lord your god he wasn't talking to pagans he wasn't talking to sinners he wasn't talking to unbelievers he was talking to people that already knew him as their father as a redeemer i am the lord your god look at verse 8 and ye shall keep my statutes and do them i am the lord which sanctify you this is the lord himself and the vocabulary the word itself is from the lord 
he himself uses the word sanctify and he uses the word holy and when you bring everything together it's like the synonymous i will make you holy i will sanctify you i want you to be holy i want you to be sanctified they're used interchangeably and that means then that when he says it will sanctify you it will make you holy it is its work its work of grace he has saved you already he has forgiven you already he has transformed your life already and he says i am the lord your god and he says because i'm the lord your god i want you to go a step further i want you to be holy i want you to be sanctified and i am the one that will do it for you it's not by struggling it's not by trying my best you try you'll fail but when god himself does the work in your heart and he does the work in your life it will be a work that will be visible that will be well known this is the doing of the lord it will be marvelous in our eyes look at ephesians chapter 5 ephesians chapter 5 and we're reading from verse 25 ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 husbands love your wives you understand a relationship already is there the man and the woman the husband and the wife have been already a relationship and the woman already belongs to the man and the lord is saying to you now even as christ also loved the church and he gave himself for it the church is talking about ecclesia in the greek the people already called out of the world and they are called to the very side of christ again these are not outsiders these are not people outside the kingdom they are people already inside the kingdom the church the called out one the church the forgiven one the church the one that is set free the church the one that is reconciled unto god and it says even as christ also loved the church and gave themselves for it that he might sanctify again that's not my vocabulary that's his vocabulary that's the intention of christ and that's the purpose of christ that christ might sanctify and cleanse it look at that again sanctification is cleansing is purging and they used interchangeably that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church is being a church that's verse 25 saved forgiven born again redeemed reconciled unto god church but now there is a step further as we look at the church the church is not glorious yet and he wants to do something that will be a new experience a subsequent experience to salvation that makes that church glorious that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish again he's using the word sanctify and he's using that as a synonym of being holy and without blemish that's what he promises to do that's what he has provided is going to do he will do it he will do it for his church i said he will do it for his church and he'll do it for members and ministers of his church in jesus name look at this in first thessalonians chapter 5 
First Thessalonians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Now you know, God cannot tell sinners who don't have grace, who are not born again, whose sins have not been washed away. He cannot tell sinners who do not know the experience of salvation to abstain from all appearance of evil. He's saying, abstain from evil. Abstain from all evil. Even abstain from all appearance of evil. Evidently, they are saved. They are born again. The children of God. That's why the commandment can come to them to abstain from all appearance of evil. And yet, as you come to verse 23, after that salvation that makes them to live a victorious life, a free life, that all the outward sins are cut up and totally taken away. Look at this, verse 23. And the very God of peace, the God who has given you peace in believing, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Being saved, born again, forgiven, we have peace with God. And that God of peace sanctify you. You see that? Salvation settled. Being born again settled. Reconciliation with God settled. And yet, on the basis of what God has done, this is what God will do. The very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray, God, that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. Again, again, look at this. He will sanctify you. And to, not to leave us in the dark. What that sanctification means, it says it will preserve you blameless. It's using the word blameless in place of the word sanctified. You'll be blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, faithful is he, our God is faithful. When he says he will save, he's faithful, he will save. When he says he will heal, he's faithful, he will heal. When he gives a promise and he says he's going to fulfill that promise, he is faithful. And he will fulfill the promise. And now as he talks about the very God of peace, sanctify you holy, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. He will do it. No promise of God will be missing in your life in Jesus' name. When he promises and he says, this is what I want to do, you will not say, uh -uh, I don't want that one. I don't need that one. He knows your need. Your need here today. And your need through life. And your need in ministry. And your need of getting to heaven. And he says, for you to be all he wants you to be. Here is what he will do. It will sanctify you entirely, spirit, soul, and body. And faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. I was waiting for a good amen. amen. The promise and the purpose of the believer's sanctification. The three points we're looking at. Number one, the problem. The problem, why? Do we need sanctification? What's the problem? What have we not got? After we got salvation, after we got reconciliation with God, what remains again? What's the problem? Point number one, the problem. Point number two, the prayer. The prayer. Christ paid, prayed. And Paul, the apostle, prayed. And we're also enjoined and commanded to pray the prayer. Point number three, the pursuit. The pursuit. You want something, 
and you want it yours it's there in the word of god and now you pursue you will receive number one the problem of depravity and inner corruption before sanctification after we are saved the bible reveals that there is something that is called depravity the nature of sin the origin of sin the root of sin depravity and inner corruption before sanctification that's the problem that's the reason why the lord is saying you're born again you're a child of god no doubt about that if you have repented and believed on the lord jesus christ but the problem still remains before the sanctification the lord will solve that problem in every one of our hearts in jesus name the problem of depravity and inner corruption before sanctification. Number two, the prayer of dedication and increased consecration for sanctification. The prayer of dedication was saying, All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him. I will freely give that's the prayer that we pray in song and we say I surrender I dedicate I set apart myself unto him and increased consecration when you are born again already you give your life to the Lord that's a form of consecration when you are born again, you read the word, you delight in the word of God. It's a form of consecration. And when you are born again, you promise the Lord, I will obey you. And so give me grace and I will serve you. I will not serve God and mammon. You only will I serve. It's a form of consecration. But now, as you want him to fulfill the promise of sanctification, in increased consecration for that sanctification the prayer of dedication and increased consecration for sanctification point number three the pursuit of destiny we have a destiny we have the place we're going there's a place in heaven that is reserved for everyone every believer and we're pursuing that the pursuit of destiny in the incorruptible city through sanctification through sanctification we're pursuing a destiny in the incorruptible city i pray you will be there that's your amen for getting to heaven Point number one now, the purpose, the, the problem of depravity and in corruption before sanctification. Uh, let's go to John chapter 17. John chapter 17 and see where Jesus prayed for his own disciples. But let's see the revelation he gives us. Look at verse 2. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. What does that mean? All the disciples that God the Father gave to Jesus, they received eternal life. He gave him power, he gave him the authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as God the Father has given him. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the man which thou gavest me out of the world. Look at that out of the world they were saved they had been chosen they have been selected 
they have been forgiven and they were taken out of the world in that same verse 6 thou gavest them me and they have kept thy word that salvation they were saved they have kept thy word a sinner couldn't keep the words of Christ. Look at verse 7. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them. And they have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou didst send me. They were saved. They believed. And they knew Christ. And they followed Christ. They received the word of God. They believed the word of God. They obeyed the word of God. Look at verse 9. I pray for them. There's still something they don't have. And I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. He separates them from the world. The world apart, he has a different prayer for the world. Forgive them, they know not what they do. That's the prayer of salvation. But now these elected, and set apart disciples is now saying, I pray for them. A prayer I cannot pray for the world. I'm praying for them. For them which thou hast given me. For they are thine. They are thine. They belong to you. They're saved. Look at verse 14. I have given them thy word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world even as i'm not of the world they were saved there's no doubt they were born again there's no doubt they were saved because jesus said i can testify about them they are not of the world even as i am not of the world look at verse 15 i pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world i have an assignment for them they are the people to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and so don't take them from the world but look at this look at this but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil god has the keeping power that uh, since they were saved they'll be kept away from sinning look at verse 16 they are not of the world. It's repeating that. For us to have assurance, the repetition is to confirm they are mine. They are believers. They're different from the world. And it says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Here comes now the definite thing. He was asking the Father, to do for them after he had cleared the point that they are of God, that they are saved. He now says in verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Look at verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone. But for them also, which shall believe on me through their word, other believers will come into the kingdom. And as they believe on me through their word, I'm also extending the prayer to them. Sanctify them. Luke chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 20. Luke chapter 10. We're looking at verse 20. In verse 20, notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written 
in heaven, no doubt, they were saved. Their names were written in heaven. What's the problem then? Why would he have to pray for their sanctification? It's the problem of depravity. Let me show you. In Matthew chapter 16, and I'm reading here from verse 15. Matthew chapter 15, chapter 16, verse 15. It says unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou. He wasn't a sinner, saved, born again. Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. That settles the salvation. He had communication with the Father, and the Father had communication with him. But look at verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Here is the problem. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. It was the will of the Father. In fact, that's the reason why the Father sent Jesus into the world to make his sacrifice and to die for us. And these people were saved. They were born again. And when Jesus told them he will be making the final sacrifice and the full sacrifice, they were sorrowful. They were not in agreement with him. That they couldn't understand. And that they wouldn't accept. And Peter actually took hold of him and said, that be far from thee. It was the depravity within that didn't allow him to see as Christ saw. And he was not one with Christ, not united with Christ in what the Father has sent him to do here. Look at verse 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, that Peter could still accommodate and Peter could still have inside him the thought and the opinion and the idea and the influence of Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan, because thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. You see that? That's the reason he was not praying for them that they would be sanctified. When there's anything in your heart that God says and Christ says, this is the way. And there's something in your heart that rebels against that. You're not committing adultery. You're not committing fornication. And you're not saying to occultism. You're not doing anything that says that you're still like you were completely when you were in the world. But your heart, your mind, your thoughts do not line up with the might of Christ. You do not have total identification with Christ in everything he plans to do. That's the depravity on the inside. The Lord will take it away. I want a good amen. amen. Look at Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 35. Mark chapter 10. We're looking at verse 35. We've established already that these people were reading about were saved. They were born again. They were not of the world. Their names were written in heaven. 
but there's a problem of this depravity. Look at Mark chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we desire. And he said unto them, what would ye that I should do for you? And they said, Grant unto us, James and John, Grant unto us only the two of us. Peter mustn't hear this one. Andrew mustn't hear this one. Matthew mustn't hear this one. But Lumi must not hear this one. For us, just the two of us. They said unto them, Grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink the, of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? And he said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye indeed shall drink of the cup that I drink, uh, that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with us shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared that place seeking not preferring others above themselves that push to want to be in a special place and forget the interest of other people that self-interest and self-promotion that's the evidence of the depravity. That's why Christ was praying for them. I'm going away to heaven. I must not leave these, my disciples, the way they are. They'll be so occupied with themselves. They'll be thinking of, what do I get out of it? What am I going to get out of it? That the great commission will suffer. Look at verse 41. And when the ten had it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. Division was coming in. The scene that brought the division and the scene that brought the displeasure and the anger. And now I cannot talk to John. So John, you are like that. You forgot how many disciples too. I too, I want a place of recognition. And you went behind to have the place of recognition. They were indignant. And Jesus had to call them and tell them, it should not be like that among my disciples. That's the evidence of the depravity that Christ was praying about. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Look at Luke chapter 10 Luke let's, let's look at it in chapter 9 Luke chapter 9 verse 49 the reason why he prayed for their sanctification Luke chapter 9 verse 49 and John answered and said master we saw one casting out devils in thy name and we forbade him because he followeth not us. John, do you really think only the twelve of you will be in heaven? Do you really think that Jesus is to be monopolized by only the twelve of you? He followeth not us. That's a depravity. They thought of themselves as the in-group, as the only one, the only one to be with Christ. And they didn't want anyone to get crash, anyone to come in from any other direction. They wanted to have a monopoly of Christ and the power of Christ. 
and they saw somebody casting out devils in the name of Christ, they said, who gave you the chance? Who gave you the authority? They didn't even go to jail to ask him, should we stop him? They stopped that man and they said, because he followeth not us. And Jesus said unto him, forbid him not. For he that is not against us is for us. It was the depravity in the heart that made them not to think like Christ, act like Christ, behave like Christ. And anyone not in their little circle, anyone that does not say exactly what they said and how they said it, anyone that looked a little bit different from them and is not part of the in-group, they stop that fellow. And Jesus said, don't do that. Don't do that. Everyone is so large. And everyone is larger than the little circle of your people. Look at verse 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they, the Samaritans, did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, his disciples saved, his disciples born again, his disciples, their names were written in heaven. His disciples, they have left all and they were following him. Yet, look at this. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that will command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Even as Elias did, Lord, look at these people. We know you. They don't know you. We recognize you. They don't recognize you. And you, the creator of the heavens and the earth, you, the king of the Jews, you, the very son of God, you, the one in total, complete authority, wanting to pass through the village and they said no, Give us chance. You don't even have to do this. We will use the anointing and the power you have given us and we'll bring fire on them and they will die. That's the depravity. They didn't want those people to remain alive. If they had brought fire upon the Samaritans and they had died, what will happen to Acts chapter 8 when Philip went to Samaria? And he preached Christ unto them. And many of those Samaritans gave their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. They were born again. What would have happened? But James and John, because of the depravity, they wanted to bring fire down. That's why he prayed for their sanctification. That spirit of wanting to call fire down upon your enemies, that spirit of wanting to destroy other people because they don't see eye to eye with you. That's the depravity and Christ removes that at sanctification. You know the case of Isaiah. He had been prophesying and then he saw the glory of God and he said, Woe is me, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And then the angel came and took the live coal and put on his tongue and said, Your sin, the root of sin, depravity, is taken away. You remember what Ezekiel said in chapter 36? Ezekiel, chapter 36, I'm reading from verse 25. Ezekiel 36, verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. And from all your filthiness, and from all your idols, will I cleanse you. That's salvation. 
salvation. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But notice verse 25, salvation. There was still something to be taken away from inside them. Verse 26, a new heart also. That word also means after I have done that other one and I've cleansed you, and I've saved you, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away. After verse 25, and they had been forgiven, and they had been cleansed, and they were saved. Now it says, there is still something inside you. And he says, I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you an heart of flesh. He will do it. I said he will do it. After salvation, there's still something necessary. Sanctification. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians Chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, brethren, born again, brethren, saved, brethren, reconciled unto God. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Born again, they were babes in Christ. And yet, they were not as spiritual as they ought to be. Verse 2, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto, born again, hitherto said, ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are carnal, yet carnal, born again, born again, brethren, in verse 1. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? That's the depravity that should be taken away. It will be taken away. Look at Second Corinthians chapter seven. I'm reading from verse one. Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse one. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, dearly beloved, born again, born again. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. What? There's still something to be cleansed from. There's still something to be taken away. There is still the gracious work of God to be done. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now we understand the problem. How does the problem get solved? That he purifies us. He sanctifies us. He takes away the Adamic nature. He takes away that propensity to sin him. And he gives us a new heart, righteous, holy, and pure. Point number two, the prayer of dedication and increased consecration for sanctification. We're looking at John chapter 17. John chapter 17. I'm reading here from verse 9. In verse 9, I pray for them, my disciples. I pray for them, those already saved. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. They are not Satan's property. They are God's property. 
they're not a property for society for the world they belong to the lord they are thine all mine are thine and thine are mine and i am glorified in them verse 16 they are not of the world even as i'm not of the world sanctify them through thy truth the word is truth that word sanctify has two sides like the two sides of a coin a coin as this side and as this other side head or tail one side of sanctify is to set apart set apart but you know these disciples had been set apart since they were following jesus christ set apart from fishing set apart from tax collecting set apart from mundane human earthly work and even set apart unto the lord the other side of the word in greek agiasmo is that they are purged they are purified and they are made holy that's what he's praying for here look at it in verse 17 again sanctify them through thy truth thy watch is true verse 19 and for their sakes i sanctify myself i set apart myself to go to the cross to die for them and to make the final sacrifice that they might be sanctified through thy truth at the price not just not just for those people alone neither pray i for these alone but for them also which shall believe that's talking about you that's talking about me the people that shall believe on me through their word how did you come to believe what john wrote as many as received him to them he gave power to become the sons of god even to them that believe on his name how did you come to believe you came to believe because of the words of matthew all ye that labor and heavy laden come unto me and ye shall find rest to your soul how did you come to believe through the word that mark had written the kingdom of god is come repent ye therefore and believe the gospel and so from those what they had written we had believed and he said i'm not only praying for them i'm praying for the people which shall believe on me through their word as christ prayed paul the apostle also prayed look at first thessalonians chapter 5 reading from verse 22 abstain from all appearance of evil now you cannot pray for sanctification if you delight in evil if you engage in appearance of evil if you do not love the lord enough to abstain from what you know is decidedly evil if you are toying with evil if you're embracing evil if you enjoy evil if you take the light in evil you cannot say i'm praying for sanctification first of all show the evidence that you are born again and now the prayer verse 23 and the very god of peace sanctify you holy and i pray god will answer this prayer i said it will answer this prayer and i pray god your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our lord jesus christ faithful is he who also will do it he will do it even in the old testament look at this prayer in the old testament we're reading from psalm 51 psalm 51 i'm reading from verse 6 behold thou desirest truth in the inward parts 
and in the healing patch thou shalt make me to know wisdom here is the prayer purge me with his and i shall be clean wash me and i shall be whiter than snow isaiah has told us come now and let us reason together says the lord let your sins be as carnage he says he'll make them as white as snow but now the prayer here is wash me and i shall be whiter than snow as white as snow forgiveness salvation but purge me wash me cleanse me i shall be whiter than snow make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice verse 10 create in me a clean heart O god and renew a right spirit within me he will do it look at isaiah chapter 6 isaiah was already a preacher before this time Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah was already a prophet before this time. But now look at this in chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his strength filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Who is me, prophet? Who is me, preacher? Who is me, pastor? Who is me, the one who had been declaring the word of God unto Israel from chapters 1 to 5? Who is me? For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean leaves. For mine eyes have seen the king. I saw vision, but I still need sanctification. My eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, with which which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar and he laid it upon my mouth and said lo this has touched thy lips what's the consequence thy iniquity is taken away and thy sin purged sin notice it's in the singular the sins like branches of the tree have been cut off. This is now the root, and it is to be totally taken away. Thank God it was done. I said, thank God it was done. To be done in every one of us in Jesus' name. Let's come back to Ezekiel chapter 36 which were read before, chapter 36, verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. When God cleanses us, we're clean. When God forgives us, we're forgiven. When God sets us free, all the bounds and all the yoke and all the force and the power of sin is taken away. And he says it shall be clean. And from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. There's a second stage now, the second work of grace. And a new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart 
out of your flesh and I will give you a kind of heart and heart of flesh. But look at verse 36. The last line in verse 36. I, the Lord, have spoken it and I will do it. Verse 37. Thus says the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I have promised I will do it, but I'm not going to do it until the people who accept the promise and own the promise and embrace the promise until they ask me. As we ask him, they will do it. Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. And here we're reading from verse 10. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10. For thus says the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. He had given the promise, but... They were not to fold their hands and said, he said he will do it. At his own time, he'll do it. When he remembers, he'll do it. When he delights to do it, he will do it. We don't have to do anything. You know? Look at verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me and ye shall grow and go and pray unto me and i will hearken unto you and ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart it's telling us that yes we will do it but we need to ask him and as we ask him he will fulfill his promise in every one of our lives in Jesus name James chapter 1 we're reading from verse 6 James chapter 1 verse 6 but let him ask in faith nothing we bring whatever God has promised to us let him ask in faith nothing we bring as he promised us salvation, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. As he promised us healing, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. As he promised us wisdom, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. As he promised us sanctification, as he said, I will cleanse you. As he said, I will take the stony heart out of your flesh let him ask in faith nothing wavering for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea dreaming with the wind and tossed let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the lord a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man, can I be sanctified? I see the promise of God, but looking at my nature, looking at my temperament, and looking at my habit, and looking at who I am, and looking at how old I am now, can I teach the old dog new, new tricks? Can something new still happen? He that wavereth is like a wave of the sea. Let not that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Look unto God. He said he will do it. He will do it. In our lives, he will do it. In our church, he will do it. For all our ministers, he will do it in Jesus' name. 
point number three now the pursuit of destiny destiny in the incorruptible city through sanctification a goal is to get to heaven but god in heaven is holy a goal is to get to heaven the angels in heaven are holy a goal is to get to heaven heaven itself is a holy place and sin cannot enter therein in psalm 24 i'm reading from verse 3 psalm 24 reading from verse 3 who shall ascend into the hill of the lord or who shall stand in his holy place he that has clean hands the salvation and a pure heart the sanctification he that has clean hands our hands are clean the lord has washed us and the lord has saved us but that's not enough and a pure heart a holy heart who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully matthew chapter 5 we're looking at verse 8 matthew chapter 5 we're reading from verse 8 blessed are the pure in heart this is a pursuit this is a prayer this is a desire this is what we are running after and this is what we are praying for blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god first john chapter 3 first john chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 1 behold what man of love the father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of god therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not beloved now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Look at verse 3. Before we can be with him in eternity, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself not as David not as Abraham not as Solomon not as Samson purifies himself even as he is pure that's what it takes the Lord will do it Titus chapter 2 verse 11 Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God. And our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from how many iniquities? All iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. He will do it. Colossians chapter 3. Reading from verse 1, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ sits on the right hand of God, set your affections on things on high, and not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is seen with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. You'll be there. I will be there. 
we shall be there in Jesus name second Timothy chapter 2 second Timothy chapter 2 reading from verse 19 nevertheless the foundation of God stand is sure having this seal the Lord knoweth them that are his and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity verse 21 if a man therefore purge himself from this it shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified 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 and meet and suitable ready for the master's use and prepared unto every good work flee youthful lusts but follow pursue righteousness faith charity peace of them that call on the Lord out of what kind of heart? Out of a pure heart. Hebrews chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crouched with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man for it became him defeated him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory not to disgrace not to shame not to sin not to degradation unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings for both he that sanctified is the one who sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren he'll take you home at the right time he'll take you home after you have done what he has called you to do here on earth well, go gloriously home in Jesus' name. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace, pursue peace with all men. No fighting, no strife, no schism. No division, no envy, no jealousy, no exaltation of self above others. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright you will not sell your birthright for you know how that have to work when he would have received, inherited the blessing. He was refused, rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Chapter 13 of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate let us go forth therefore unto him a personal decision let us go forth therefore unto him a personal consecration let us therefore go forth unto him without the camp bearing his reproach for here have we no continuing city but we seek one to come that heaven Thank God you'll be there. 
Thank God I'll be there. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself so that where I am, there you will be also. But you know what it takes? It takes salvation. It takes sanctification. It takes holiness. Let's come back now as we're under to John chapter 17. John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Without sanctification, there'll be argument. There'll be jealousy. There'll be infighting. There'll be division. There may be like a superficial agreement, but underneath in our hearts, there'll be deep, deep-seated disagreement. But he says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Verse 21, that they all may be one. Sanctify them that they all may be one. Transparent unity. Heart unity, continual unity, dedicated unity. That I forget myself, you forget yourself. We look unto Jesus alone who sanctifies us, that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and the glory which thou gavest me i have given unto them that they may be one even as we are one i in them and thou in me that they may be made perfect in one that they that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. After that sanctification, and we have one heart and one mind with Christ, and we have one heart and one mind with one another, he prays that we will be with him where he is, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovedst me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love where we is, thou hast loved me, may be in them, and I in them. That's the word of God, and that's what he wants us to have. That's a great gift of grace he has provided for every one of us who will receive. I receive in Jesus' name. I accept in Jesus' name. Everything God has for me will be mine in Jesus' name. It will be yours. I said it will be yours. Why don't you stand up then and tell the Lord everything the Lord has provided and bought for me, everything the Lord has promised, everything the Lord has prayed for, everything the Lord has made available for me will be mine. Open your mouth and tell the Lord, make sure you are a possessor and a partaker of this great blessing from heaven. <laughs> 